I'm Mr. Buckingham and this video is on community interactions. So this Nemo fish is uh, a clownfish and they live with another organism called the sea anemone. This is just an anemone. And why do they live together? It would be kind of strange because anemones sting other organisms, but the clownfish has, secretes this mucus around its body so that it does not get stung by the anemone. So uh, in this video, we'll explore why does this happen? What are the terms associated with these kind of relationships? So uh, we're mainly gonna talk about populations and how populations interact with each other, different organisms or the same organisms, and the effects of those interactions. So they could be positive, they could be neutral, or they could be negative. And all of those examples are an example of symbiosis. Symbiosis just means that they're going to live together, different populations living together. And this could have a, a great impact on the ecosystem. And ecosystems will have these feedback mechanisms. So the, the ecosystem has these checks and balances systems so it doesn't um, get out of whack or the ecosystem is healthy. And part of those interactions could get out of control and that could lead to a catastrophe. And those catastrophes, uh, one here in Portland, in Oregon, is the English ivy and how invasive it is. So this table will explain the positive and negative effects that each organism has on the other. So if it says effect on X, this is going to be one organism, and Y is going to be a different organism. And we'll go through each one of these terms. If it's a zero, that means that there's no effect on the organism. If it's a plus, a positive effect, minus means a detrimental or a negative effect on the organism. So the first one, neutralism, that means that both organisms are unaffected. Um, so their presence together, they will not interact positively or negatively with each other. Um, examples of one effect, so effect on Y, one benefits and the other is unaffected. So X is unaffected. So this shark is unaffected with these little tiny amore eels. Let me make that better color. Remora eels. And they will latch onto sharks and they'll get a free ride and some protection from predators because no one's going to battle a shark. Um, and the shark is mainly unaffected by this. Uh, another example are uh, cattle. When they graze, they dig up a bunch of earth and in that earth and that grounds, there's a bunch of goodies, uh, insects and worms, and these egrets will go along and they'll pick off all of these uh, worms and insects, and the cattle are completely unaffected. So again, they are unaffected. The cattle and the egrets definitely benefit from this interaction. Uh, the next one, competition, which is a little weird. You wouldn't think that both uh, organisms would be negatively impacted, but uh, when two animals or plants go through competition, uh, it's really energetically expensive um, and there's a lot of stress involved with competing. So there are two types of competition, one that's called intra-species and one that's called inter. If it's intra, that means that it's the members of the same species. Comp competing. And we can also call that intraspecific if we change the suffix or interspecific competition. And so these lions, uh, males commonly uh, compete with one another for mates or for territory. So that would be intraspecific competition. Uh, these muscles and barnacles, so this is, a, this is a muscle and then these little white ones are uh, little barnacles, and they will compete for space on these intertidal rocks, so the shoreline of some ocean area. So if it's two different species, so barnacle, different species, then muscle is going to be inter-specific competition. And both of these examples, they will both lose, uh, and it's a negative impact on each other. And then mutualism. Mutualism is a uh, fascinating uh, symbiotic relationship. All of these being symbiotic relationships, but 
mutualism in particular um, are the, the evolution of these uh, interactions are bizarre and fascinating so uh, a common one you see is all these uh, flowers need to disperse their pollen and they need that pollen to go to another flower and it's really hard for them to do it it can happen in uh, the wind can carry some of the pollen uh, rain sometimes can carry pollen but uh, insects are the best uh, way for that pollen to go from flower to flower and so this bee will get nectar so nectar is going to be its food that it will gain from the flower and it will crawl around get super messy and it will pick up all of this pollen and this pollen will then be carried with the bee to another flower so the male reproductive organ of the flower which has the pollen will go to the female reproductive organ uh, and the the sperm and egg will uh, meet and it will uh, make an ovum in the next flower so that's a that's a way that the flower will then be able to reproduce and uh, have more flowers and the bee will get food from the flowers so both of those organisms will benefit and then the next example is this oxpecker and uh, the rhino the oxpecker will pick off little parasites that are on the rhino so oxpecker will get food so it's benefiting and the the rhino is getting like a you know spa treatment from the the oxpecker uh, same thing happens with uh, this relationship with this alligator or crocodile can't don't know which one it is um, and then this little little bird so the bird will go in and will you know give a little dentist exam to this this uh, alligator or crocodile and um, the alligator or crocodile gets um, or the the bird gets food and the alligator or crocodile gets uh, a little clean, cleansing and then the last one parasitism parasitism is uh, humans think it's pretty gross I do at least um, so the mosquito is a classic example so mosquitoes need our blood in order to uh, reproduce and so they will suck the blood or they'll draw up the blood uh, from organisms not just humans and they will need that host organism or else they will not survive in some way uh, same thing so this is one organism so that the human will uh, not benefit so it's negatively impacted and the mosquito will benefit so one benefits one is one is affected negatively the other one is an ant and this fungus parasite which is fascinating go look it up planet earth or life I can't remember which one it is but uh, some crazy movies uh, and clips of this fungus that infects ants and what it will do is it'll make the ant um, freak out and it will go somewhere else in the colony and be alone and then this beautiful like fungus comes out of its head or, or abdomen or wherever uh, and then the fungus will then spread its seed afterwards uh, this egg this nest so obviously this egg is a little different and it will be bigger and this is called brood parasitism and this um, bird it's the cowbird will lay its egg in another species um, nest and when that happens the the cowbird egg will uh, hatch first and the other species doesn't know it's a different bird and it'll start feeding that bird first and then this cowbird baby will actually push out some of the other eggs and it'll uh, push out some of the other uh, babies that are in that nest and so what happens is that cowbird basically gets um, some free child rearing which is uh, decimating some of the populations of other birds, which is not a good thing, but they figured it out for sure. So the cowbird would definitely benefit and the other bird would be negatively impacted. All right, and so uh, ecosystems have uh, different control mechanisms so that the ecosystem is healthy and, and uh, will be in check. So examples I use are one, this uh, speeding uh, sign. So normally we try to keep to the speed limit or else we get pulled over and get a, an annoying ticket. 
So uh, when we see this sign that has been popping up in the past decade and they see, oh, you're going over the speed limit or you're going under the speed limit, we will want to try and hit that target. So this one, if we're going 26, we will uh, get that feedback from that sign and we'll try and go a little bit faster. Or if we're going, let's say 46, oh, we need to slow down. So that's, that's an example of a negative feedback. If we're going above the speed limit or under the speed limit and we're trying to get to the speed limit. Uh, an example of a positive feedback system is our ice caps. Um, they are melting at a pretty fast rate. So our sun will, the sunlight will reach the earth and it'll bounce back if it hits ice. And ice uh, is very bright and it will reflect that sunlight. However, if the sunlight hits open ocean, it does not get reflected back as much. Instead, it is converted into heat. When that happens, it starts to heat our Earth. So all of that heat becomes trapped from our atmosphere, and then it is reflected back. So what happens then is that less of the ice is available because it starts to melt. So then our ice cap becomes smaller, which means that more of that sunlight is going to be reflected back in heat, and that sunlight coming down, and it's not reflected. So then what happens is uh, uh, the outcome, so the heat, affects the beginning of that cycle. So the sunlight coming down to the earth, the, the ice reflects it, but some of it is absorbed in the water. The water heats up, it melts more ice, and then the ice is no longer able to reflect that heat back, or reflect that light back. So that's a positive, uh, positive feedback system. And that is detrimental for some of the um, species who live up there, which is the polar bear, and the polar bear no longer have that ice habitat and they have to swim long distances and they end up dying because they can't swim that far, which is really sad. So with that in mind, we have uh, some natural occurring feedback mechanisms in ecosystems. So a common one is the predator-prey relationships, uh, which we've talked about before. And so this uh, elk population, I believe it's the blue, is starting to decline. So that might be a good thing for the ecosystem so that they don't uh, ruin some of the other vegetation. Well, it is controlled. The feedback mechanism is predation. So this population of wolves fluctuates with the population of the elk. And so uh, you can see that it starts to grow the uh, wolf population when there is available prey, which is going to be the elk, and then their population will go down, the wolf population will go down because there is not a lot of Prey, the elk population is starting to go down as well. So both populations, uh, if we map it out, will fluctuate back and forth. And those are uh, some mechanisms, uh, feedback mechanism. And that's a negative feedback. Uh, so there are, all of these populations have some sort of natural feedback uh, system to, to make sure that they are kept in check. So uh, if you've ever seen these birds, the, the role that these birds go through uh, is just to make sure that they're next to each other um, and not get eaten by predators. Um, and this is a way that their behavior influences other members of the, the population. Uh, these bison are, are controlled by their habitat. They're controlled by um, the population size is controlled by some of the, the predators in the area. And some of the trees, uh, you notice in maybe in Oregon, there's like one type of tree. Well, why is that happening? Um, and why aren't there more like broadleaf uh, organisms in that population? It just depends on the area, it depends on what kind of feedback mechanism there is. Uh, something that's not having a feedback mechanism or one way that it's not having a uh, control over the population number is English ivy and English ivy has been growing out of control and taking over 
uh, some of the places, especially in Oregon, um, which is really bad. So an invasive species first is a non-native organism, and it will outcompete other natives. And this can be really bad. And we're seeing a lot more uh, this century because we are, uh, with our travel, we're making all of these, or taking all of these different organisms and putting them in, in different areas. So some person decided that their yard or whatever would look great with English ivy. Well, that English ivy got out of control. And it came to the western coast and now has taken over um, a big section of Forest Park. And you can see in this photo above that um, it will blanket the entire area and it will actually choke out trees and it will choke out, uh, you can see this little tiny fern is kind of like the last one left of that area, which is really bad. So other organisms rely on those native populations of plants. And if the English ivy takes over, then it's, it's really bad for that ecosystem. We are trying to combat that, and uh, when I went to college at University of Portland, we had a volunteer day, and we all went out to a part of Forest Park, and we pulled English ivy off of the trees, which is pretty hard work, uh, but that seems to be the only way that we can eradicate uh, English ivy. And there are parts of Forest Park that don't have English ivy, so uh, Audubon, Audubon Society of Portland, their grounds that they own does not have English ivy and some northern parts of Forest Park don't have English ivy uh, but if you get closer to the city in Portland it will definitely have that ivy and it just doesn't look good a and b the ecosystem in that area or that just that area look is unhealthy and uh, you can see the wildlife is suffering from that so if you are interested in volunteering with them you should go to this website and you can help English Ivy. It's a really cool thing that they do. And that's it. Goodbye.